I invite you to stand under that umbrella with me today as we think about the goodness of God. We have been in our Love Cycle series, and I'm excited to continue this. Now, I'm just curious, as a quick survey, how many singles do we have in the room? Single? All right. If you're online or at the campus, I want to hear you shout out. If you're single, put it in the chat. Single and satisfied, even if it's still a work in progress. Even if it's still a work in progress. All right. Now, how many married couples do we have in the room? Married couples in the room. Oh, okay. Y'all clap like y'all didn't have to fight for anything. Huh? Where are the married couples at? Oh, okay. All right. If you're in the campus or online, make sure to tell married and on a mission. Just put that in the chat. That's what we're going to talk about today, what it means to be married on a mission, to have a marriage that's on a mission. And if you are not married, let me just assure you, this applies to you, because all of us are impacted by healthy marriages. If you've never been married or you're divorced, I promise you, you were impacted by the marriage or lack of marriage you saw growing up. Marriage is all around us. It shapes the way we love. It shapes the way we deal with authority and order. It shapes the way we sacrificially serve one another. Family is the foundation that God has given us for humanity. If you're not married or divorced, then you have found family in other ways. But the marriage institution is what God is using, using to shape society, which is why it's so important that we not fail at it. It's so important that we not fail at it. So when Conway and I first got married, y'all, it was interesting. <laughs> we thought we knew what we were doing. I don't know if any of you were like that, but uh, we had read the books and we thought we were smart. We had mentor couples. We had done premarital. Conway even went to a conference, a marriage conference, before we got married by himself. He was just a single dude sitting at a conference <laughs> taking notes and doing recon. He was, like, convinced, like, we are going to kill it in this marriage game. We are both, we are both achievers. I don't even know how much of it was for the Lord. We just didn't want to lose that marriage. We were like, we're about to kill it. We win at everything. We try. We're about to win in marriage. <laughs> and then we got married. And... Our courtship was very short, so we courted about 10, well, I don't want to say 10 months. We had known each other 10 months on the day we got married. It was very short. So uh, we were trying to be super spiritual, and, you know, <laughs> the Lord said yes, and so we, we moved forward with marriage. But here's the thing. In the beginning, you don't have to really check your heart a lot, okay? Because we had a heart for the Lord, and you have to have a heart for the Lord. Because marriage is hard with Jesus. Amen. If you don't have Jesus... I don't know how people are doing it. I don't know. I don't know. Me and Jesus argue every day about this marriage thing. I don't know how people <laughs> doing it without Jesus. I'm not talking about without church. I'm talking about without Jesus. So we had Jesus, praise the Lord, because he has come through many times. Our hearts were for the Lord, but our hearts weren't really for each other. Here was the challenge. We knew all the principles. We knew what a husband should do, what a wife should do. And the Bible gives us clear, overarching principles of marriage. But the Bible doesn't tell you who should do the cooking. Okay, the Bible doesn't tell you. I just need y'all to know, when I first met Conway's parents, and by the way, I have amazing in-laws. I know I'm blessed. I have amazing in-laws. When I went to Jamaica and met my in-laws for the first time, my mother-in-law came out with a tray that was my father-in-law's dinner, and it had a flower on it. And I remember sitting there going, whose birthday is it? <laughs> I don't, oh, this is so nice. What's the occasion? And she was like, it's Tuesday, <laughs> you know? I was confused. So I was like, flower and tray and a napkin and a charger and a whole, it was a whole situation. And Conway was like, yeah, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Watch and learn. <laughs> and I was like, bro, it's too late. <laughs> it's too late. I grew up in a house where my father was a cook, y'all. Not an average cook. I mean, he would come home and be like, yeah, I bought a flotch and shrimp and made some hollandaise sauce and later. I mean, cook. We waited for my dad to cook. My mama cooked out of necessity. So, but my dad enjoyed cooking, right? Like, we waited for him to cook a lot on Sunday and try to see if we could squeeze it till Wednesday. Like, that's how he was. And so he cooked for us all the time. He enjoyed cooking, you know? He cleaned up. He was just, I mean, he took care of all the plants. He was just that guy, right? So I'm sitting here looking like, Lord, you funny. This is really funny. <laughs> and so the first couple of months of our marriage, I remember <laughs> Conway was like, I'm hungry. What's for dinner? I was like, I'm hungry too. <laughs> what are we going to do about that? <laughs> 
the kitchen is dark. Nobody's in the kitchen. I, I think I'm about to walk home, walk into the smell of dinner prepared. I walked in, he was like, oh, there you are, okay. I was like, what are you waiting on? Because I grew up in a home where whoever got home first started the meal. My husband grew up in a home where his, his, my mother-in-law takes service to another level. That's just how she is. She serves above and beyond. She serves her husband. She serves me. She serves her children. That's just how she is. So there was never any need for anyone else to do that. And so we sitting there looking at each other hungry. And that happened, that happened a lot. But then you have other things, right? You have unspoken expectations. Y'all know about the secret standards, right? I didn't tell you, but you're supposed to know if you love me, you can read my mind. Right? Every healthy marriage is built on that, right? Secrets that you had to figure out, right? It's been 12 years and you still don't know, right? Because you didn't say it, though. <laughs> right? Time does not bring intelligence. You don't just go to a college campus for 10 years and walk away with a degree. You have to be in a class, be taught, learn, fail, retake the class. Like, that's, that's what it takes. And so I, I remember our first Valentine's Day, the early years, and my husband was like, oh, my gosh, I got you. I ho he hooked you up. He came in with a huge bear and chocolates, and I don't like stuffed animals, and I don't like chocolate. I am that, that person that doesn't like chocolate. And he was just confused. He was like, but this is Valentine's. I said, yeah, but where's the card? Did you write me a card? And he was like, a what? <laughs> yeah, there's a section in the grocery store. Because <laughs> my family was a card family. We kept Hallmark in business, right? Card for everything, Thanksgiving, Grandparents' Day. My mama found a card that said, congratulations on your first apartment. I don't even know where she got that. <laughs> it, we just had cards for everything. It's, you know, it's full moon day, here go a card, like everything. And so by the year five, y'all, he still brought the bear and the chocolates, because, I mean, it's unusual that a person doesn't like chocolate. So no matter how many times I say it, still brought the bear and chocolate. So I was like, oh, thank you so much. I just took it to work. And then I remember, <laughs> I remember I had prepared dinner. So, you know, I'm feeling myself. I was like, I have prepared dinner. Does heaven take note? And so I was sitting there and waiting on him to come home, and he called. I said, where are you? He was like, I am at the grocery store. I was like, why do you sound like, I'm standing in front of all these cards, and I cannot figure out which one you, I mean, the anxiety. So y'all, he came home with about nine unsigned cards. He was like, here, happy Valentine's Day. Listen, they were still, they weren't even all the way in the envelope. They just like slid into the lid in the Kroger bag. He was like, my God, here. I mean, just stressed, right? But this is what those early years look like because at the beginning, you don't need to work hard for the marriage because the passion is working for you. And when you say, where do you want to go eat? And your spouse says, oh, I don't care wherever you want to go. Then, then you pick a place, you get to the place, and he or she is like, oh, I didn't really want this. You're like, okay, we can go somewhere else. <laughs> get at about eight years. <laughs> then you're going to get to the restaurant and say, I asked you where you wanted to go. Every time we do this, we end up here, and then you say that's not what you wanted. Then you come in here and make nine substitutes on the menu, and the server gonna mess with our food, and then we're gonna have a bad night. Like, it's not gonna be, oh, okay, let's go somewhere else. It's gonna be like, we're here now. Next time I ask you, you need to say something. <laughs> well, when I said I don't care, I thought you knew what I like. Well, why would I know you? Like, that's what happens, right? So it's just not cute anymore. Because now you're dealing with the reality of different family backgrounds, how you handle money, how you handle conflict. And right when you think you almost know what you're doing, you have kids. You have kids. They make you question all your adult, choice, adult choices. You're like, am I smart? I thought I understood how life works. Everything begins to shift. And what happens is you have to make some decisions. Because as the differences start to pile up, it's going to make it difficult to connect. Sometimes people come to us or they sit on the couch and they're ready to separate, they're ready for a divorce, and when you ask why, they can't even articulate one big thing. They're just like, this is too much. It's too much. Because it's a million small little things, right? Solomon says it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. But sometimes it's huge things, and, and, and those large, important differences, they can affect intimacy. So whatever you value, your spouse keeps failing at that thing, then you're like, intimate? Don't, don't rub on me. You, do you know what you said to me four days ago and you still haven't addressed the fact that that thing starts to stick in your head? And when that continues to happen over time, you have to make a decision. Am I going to stay 
we're going to work through this, keep practicing at this marriage thing, or am I going to leave because it's too hard? The only way, the only way you can begin to make a good decision is that you are anchored in understanding the mission of marriage. If you don't understand what God intended for marriage, you will replace what you want for your marriage and make that be the mission. But God says, I have an intention bigger than what you're wanting in this moment. If you don't understand that, it will be impossible to stay in a healthy marriage. Now, some of us might stay, but it's still not healthy. It will be impossible to stay in a healthy marriage. So for a few moments today, I want us to look at a passage of scripture, and then we're going to go through some practical application so that we can re-solidify in our own hearts. What is the mission of marriage? I think Jesus gives us some insight like he always does. And so let's stand up for a moment. Let's read Matthew chapter 19. We're going to read the word of the Lord. So I need y'all to pay attention to some key words because now we've got the Pharisees talking to Jesus. Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. We're going to read together. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Okay, you already see where this is going. They didn't even say for a hard time. They said any cause. Jesus, we want a blank check. We, this is what we want. And they want to know if it's lawful. Like, is it okay with you? But you know this was a test. So there's no good intention in this, right? This is the flesh starting to rear up and try to get what it wants. Verse 4, he answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Next verse. And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Verse 6, so they are no longer two but one flesh, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Now this word for separate is the same word in the Hebrew for divorce as what the Pharisees are asking. So he's saying, quit tripping. Like they're asking him, but the Pharisees were supposed to be the masters of the law, right? Is it lawful? So Jesus is saying to them, wait a minute, have you not read? You asking me about laws, but you haven't read the first one. This is a quote, uh, let, no man, let, let a man and wife leave and cleave. That quote is from Genesis 2. Jesus is like, I don't even have to give you anything new. This has already been said from the beginning. This is what's been said from the beginning. So if you understand this word that you claim to know, you wouldn't even be asking me this question. God has already laid out the intention of marriage. There's going to be so many times, y'all, where our flesh rises up. We feel a certain way. We think we have a case. Surely the Lord wouldn't want me to feel this way. Surely the Lord would want me to be happy. Surely the Lord has said this is enough. Enough is enough. And so you know what? We spend time praying for a new revelation so God can affirm what we're feeling and he's going to take you back to the beginning. He's saying, I don't even need to say anything new. He didn't even give the disciples a new word. He said, what God said in the beginning still stands. So don't let your feelings Try to rearrange my truth so you feel better about what you're about to do. Don't let your feelings try to rearrange truth. That's what will happen. You're feeling a certain way. You're not trying to hear that word. You're like, but Lord, what about my situation? And he's saying, have you not heard? Have you not read? From the beginning. This is what the Lord has said. Verse 7. Look what they say, y'all. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? Okay, now, when you say, where's the lie? Here's the lie. Command. Moses didn't command you, right? But when you want something, your flesh will be like, you know what? That's what the Lord is saying. You should do it. Go ahead and try it. Go ahead and do, do what you want. The Lord is saying that. It was not a command. And look at Jesus' response in verse 8. He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed, you see that? Is that the same as command? Allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. He said the intention was never divorce, even when there was adultery. He said, but your hearts were hard and your pride was strong. And you couldn't imagine staying with somebody who had the nerve to betray you. 
and you didn't see yourself as a betrayer to God and you didn't understand covenant and you didn't understand commitment and you didn't see your own adultery against the Lord. And you didn't understand how you have violated him so many times, how you've put other gods before him. Your heart was hard. You couldn't hear his truth. So because of that, not a command, but he gave you a concession, a concession. It's not his first choice. It's his grace. Here's what they say in verse 9. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality, that's the grace, and marries another commits adultery. And now listen, the disciples, they might have the wisest line in this whole passage. Let's look at verse 10. The disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. Amen. We've heard the word of the Lord. Y'all can take your seats. The disciples were like, you know what? We've heard enough. I hear it, Lord. I think we've come to a conclusion. So what's happening here, y'all, is that the Pharisees are trying to test Jesus because they're trying to get their way. They want to know what Jesus thinks about divorce. There were two prevailing schools of thought at the time. Hillel was a, a prominent Jewish leader, and Shammai was a prominent Jewish leader. Hillel said you divorce for any reason at all. If you get tired of looking at her, you find somebody that's better, she'd have put too much salt in your food, she's not cooking right. Literally, this is what it said. Like, if she didn't prepare your meal, if she didn't uh, stay attractive to you, whatever. Hillel was like, just leave, right? But Shammai had a much, conser much more conservative approach. He said there has to be some violation of the marriage covenant. Like, there has to be some kind of sexual immorality which was held in high regard. And he says it has to be some significant violation of the marriage vow if you're going to consider divorce. So the Pharisees were trying to trip Jesus up, and what he does is he takes them back to the beginning. He's saying, you asking me questions, but I'm asking you, have you not read? He said, you coming to me acting like there's not already an answer for this. How many times? Do we come to the Lord hoping he's going to say something different than what I'm reading? But Lord, am I the exception? He's like, no, you're not. But Lord, what about my situation? I need you to look. Do you, do you understand my, yes, girl, I created everybody. Yes, sir, I get it. You're not the exception. Have you not heard? He takes them back to the beginning. He is reminding them that from the beginning, God has said marriage is part of the intention of creation, Right? Now, that evolves over time in various cultures because of the behaviors and choices of mankind. But right after God took the rib from Adam and made Eve, he says, listen, you know what? Therefore, a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. He's like, oh, this, this is good. So this was his intention from the beginning. What I'm creating, God says, let no man divorce. Let no man separate. So he, Jesus says, you already have your answers. Then the Pharisees do what we do often, and they say, but this is what Moses commanded. And Jesus says, no, that was a concession. That's not a command. Here's the intention of the Lord. He is trying to challenge them to say, get away from trying to get an a a override for what you're feeling right now. Amen. We love an override. We want a special now revelation. This is what the Lord told me. But, but what he said, did it line up with what he had already said? Because everything I need to know is in the word of God. And so Jesus is saying, you're talking about Moses, I'm talking about the garden. What God said before Moses gave y'all grace in that concession, here was the intention of the Lord. But he said, it's because of your hardness of heart that the Lord had to give that allowance. So the first point, there's only two points, and then we're going to get to our handouts. The first point here from this passage is that the condition of the heart determines the health of the marriage. He said it was your hard heart where the Lord gave grace and gave you this concession. Now, Jesus doesn't say this lightly. He understands the weight of a broken covenant. God understands the pain of divorce, church. In Isaiah 54, 5, you know what? The Lord calls himself Israel's husband. He says, your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And then in Jeremiah 3, 8, it says, for all the adulteries of that faithless one, Israel, I had sent her away with a decree of divorce. Like Israel had committed so much adultery and faithlessness against the Lord. He says, I'm going to send her away with a decree of divorce. So when Jesus talks about divorce in the Gospels, he's not taking it lightly. But look at the mercy of God. Same chapter, Jeremiah 3, 12 through 14. Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will not look upon you in anger, for I am merciful, declares the Lord. Return to me, O faithless children. 
He's like, I sent you away, but come on back. Even though you have violated me, you've chosen other gods, you've worshipped other gods above me, you've defiled me, you've disobeyed me over and over again. You cheat on me, I take you back. You are not faithful to me, I take you back. You betray me, I take you back. You're not loyal to me, I take you back. This is the pattern of the Lord with the children of Israel. And if we're honest, it's the pattern of the Lord with us. With us. Every single time, he's like, I take you back. I take you back. Matter of fact, we have so abused grace, we're not even afraid that God might reject us. We just think forgiveness is a tool that we just pull up whenever we want because we know he's a covenant-keeping God. We know that he is not going to put our relationship with him in jeopardy. He's like, eternity is secure. That's how we're able to live out this life. And so Jesus is saying the condition of your heart impacts the health of your marriage. If you're hard-hearted, like he told the Pharisees, he says you're hard-hearted so you couldn't really understand the fullness of the idea of covenant. All you're thinking about is how you feel in the moment. And I just want to say a word. If you're here today and you're divorced, maybe you're in the middle of one, I need you to understand that today is not about shame. Today is not about guilt. Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Grace abounds. But today, everybody, whatever your state in life, we want to learn God's mission for marriage so that we can align our hearts. You might need to be in a place where you need to repent, confess, realign, be restored, but grace is yours. Today is not about condemnation because many of us have stayed in marriages and our hearts were divorced. So th there's no badge of honor. The goal is to figure out how can we live on mission for our marriage. So many times we reduce the standard of what we expect out of marriage. And God is saying, I don't want your marriage just kind of making it and being mediocre. I want you flourishing. I want you thriving. I want you figuring out what it is you do together, serving each other sacrificially, mutual submission. Y'all, when you first start out, you have all these lofty ideas about marriage. You're like, this is what we're about to change the world together. And then over time, what happens, you're like, well, let's just stay together. <laughs> My God, at least we together. If that is your line, your marriage is not flourishing. Because there is an assignment greater on your marriage than not arguing. There is a destiny greater than not divorced. It doesn't matter if you're not thriving and flourishing. So you have to ask yourself, what is this mission that God has given us? Here's the second idea. Your commitment impacts the condition of your heart. Your commitment level. See, the Pharisees were ready to be out, like, quickly, for no reason. They just were like, I mean, just in case. Do we have freedom to divorce for any cause? Well, they didn't have the right kind of commitment. They didn't understand. Second point, your commitment impacts the condition of your heart. Now, there's two kinds of commitment that we have when we go into marriage. There is product-based commitment, and there is promise-based commitment. Now, product-based commitment says, when you produce what I want, I am committed to you. Promise-based commitment says, regardless of what you produce, I am committed to you. Now, in theory, we know we should have a promise-based commitment. But in reality, we typically have a product-based commitment. You need to produce something in order for me to stay here. When you ask someone why they're going to get married or what do you love about this person, they're going to say, oh, they support me. They make me feel this way. We connect in this way. We have shared dreams or we have common interests or they understand me or I understand. Most of those things in that list are going to be what that person does for me. This person makes me happy. In the absence of my father, he provides security. When my mother was unhealthy, she's so nurturing. She's always on my team. He's always on my side. It's me. So when those become the basis for marriage, when that product starts to diminish in quality, commitment gets called into question. Like, hold on, we went into this thing because I thought you were going to produce a certain thing for me. Now you're not producing anymore. So this happened because recently, y'all, I thought about this. I was watching something. I like documentaries. I do, and I was watching one about food, food safety and the integrity of the food in America. Just don't, don't watch any. I'm just saying that. 
because then you'll be in your pantry depressed. And you're like, nothing is good, it's all a mess. Just say grace, make sure you say grace when you eat and trust the Lord for the rest. But I was really committed, I'm like, we're gonna change some things. Now we can't change everything, but let me see what we eat the most of, like some dairy and my, my kids love bread. And so I go to the grocery store, y'all, to start looking for bread because the one, the bread we were using was okay. You know, if you begin to read the ingredients in bread, you don't know what this is. If you know how to make bread, you know this is too many things to be in bread. And so I would read it, and I'd go, oh, I'm looking out for certain keywords. And I'm like, ooh, it shouldn't have that in it. So I start going through things. I was like, uh, uh, okay, not that one, not that one. So my kids go to pick out the bread that we normally get. And I say, no, I'm going to try something different. I didn't say anything. You know, I just had to slip it into the basket. And so uh, I remember the next morning at breakfast, y'all, I made the toast and everything. And I didn't say anything. I just made the toast like I normally make it. And my son was like, what is this? I was like, this is bread. He said, like, where's our other bread? I said, do you know what was in that other bread? That other bread might take your life one day. I am, a, <laughs> your mother is looking out for you. Do you know these ingredients? And he's just looking at me like, but this bread has, what, what is this dirt in here or something? I was like, that is the Lord's earth. It is grains, it's good for you. He was like, yeah, these grains don't go with my peanut butter and jelly, so I don't. He was like, Mom. And so I had to give a concession, went back to the old bread for a little while. But now I don't say anything, y'all. So every week or so, I'll try a new one. And they look at me. I just make the toast and I leave the kitchen. But then they'll be like, Mom. I'm like, listen, you're going to thank me one day. You're going to thank me later that I care about what's going in your body. But what's, here's what's funny. They used to have a favorite brand of bread. They know they go in the grocery store, they get what we're going to get, and they know. But now they go to the bread aisle and they're like, I don't. I mean, which one are we getting? <laughs> Because guess what? I have a product-based commitment when it comes to bread. If it doesn't satisfy, I'm going to try a new brand. If it's not what I want for my family, I'm going to switch it up. I might change it up. Years from now, they're not going to have one brand that sticks with them. They're going to know their mom kept changing it until she got it right. But you can't do that with marriage. It's not a product. You don't get to go to your spouse and say, well, let me see. Now, wait a minute, because when you first got married, you said that you were going to stay a size 8. Then you were going, and then we were going to have five kids, but now you said you only want one. Okay, oh, no, no, let me see. Oh, let me see this other bread. I mean, I know I'm committed to this bread, but let me see this other bread, because when I was out, this other bread caught my eye. I'm wondering, I mean, is it bad to hold this bread while I'm committed to this bread? I mean, I don't, well, let me, you know what? Let me smell it. Let me see if it's fresh. I still like my bread. I still like my bread, but I'm just seeing, you know, the Lord made all the bread. Ooh, you know what, Lord? I'm trusting you in Jesus' name for new bread, fresh bread. Let me, I wonder if I touch the bread. Oh, it is softer. I wonder, no, I'm just kidding. But that's what happens in our marriage. We start shopping. And some of us as Christians will never officially get divorced but we start to separate our hearts from our spouses. We're looking for a better product. And here's the lie. You can't even assess the better product when you already have a product. Because all you're looking for is the 30% that your current product might not have. They don't have to be the whole loaf of bread, okay? So it's always a lie anyway. But when you have a product-based commitment, you're looking for what's going to satisfy you. When you have a promise-based commitment, like Jesus refers to in Genesis 2, how we see over and over throughout Scripture that God values the vow that a man takes, then you're saying, regardless of how I feel, regardless of how you act, here's my commitment. So let's look at this. We have a little checklist of what it means to have product and promise-based commitment. Product-based commitment says, if I am committed to you if you produce. I'm committed if you produce. This is on your handout. You can start on the back. Promise base says, I am committed based on a promise. Like, this is my word. It doesn't matter, right? Y'all, when my kids have uh, their friends spend the night, I mean, everybody can't spend the night, right? It's got to be the right, the right friends. But when those friends come over, I am making a commitment to their parents. I'm saying I'm going to care for this child, feed the child, keep the child safe, all those things. It doesn't matter how misbehaved that child is. I'm not going to break the promise I made to their parents because that child cannot outbehave themselves from my safety, from my security, from my provision while they're in my care. Marriage is saying, God, 
this is your son, this is your daughter. They not behaving well, but my promise is to you first and then to them. So show me how to care for them. Show me how you want me to function in this position. And I don't want y'all to run to the extremes, okay? I know there are situations where people aren't safe or things are unhealthy, things are dangerous. I'm not talking about those extremes. I'm talking about the main reasons that people get separated and divorced. It's for dissatisfaction. Irreconcilable differences is not a thing. Falling out of love is not a thing because you don't fall into a covenant. You make a covenant. So if you want to get out, no matter where you fail, you have to break the covenant. So God is saying, let me give you the uncomfortable truth that from the beginning, this has been the goal. Here's the second thing with product-based commitment. Expected production determines satisfaction. So we're good as long as you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You know when that gets off, then people are like, uh, today is not a good day. If the mood of the marriage is dependent on your behavior, or your spouse's behavior, you have a product-based commitment. For promise, promise-based commitment, production is desired but not required. Y'all, this is one of the hardest things to grasp. Because it's not saying that you don't have any standards and no expectations. You need to have hard conversations with your spouse. You gotta work on communication, conflict. How do we handle money? How do we deal with sexual intimacy? How do we deal with the kids or parenting? You want production, but when production's not there, it does not alter the commitment. And that's where you say hallelujah, because that's how God treats you. When you don't produce, he still has a promise to you. He says, I'm yours, I'm available. How many of us have received grace on the worst week of our lives? Knowing we should have deserved something else, and God says, I'm gonna give you mercy instead. Knowing we should have been exposed for our foolishness, he says, I'm gonna protect you instead. Knowing we turned our back on him and he gave us warning after warning, we did what we want to do anyway, ask forgiveness, and he said, come back. Production is desired, but it's not required in a promise-based commitment. Number three, unmet desires lead to divorce. Because eventually you're like, I can't take it. You're not doing what I need, I'm not going to stay. Number two, in promise, unmet desires lead to discussion and direction. And I'm not trying to oversimplify it. And by the way, the discussion is not with your spouse. The discussion is with the Lord. You ask the Lord, what do I do? How do I respond? Y'all, if you ask him, he's going to tell you. And you say, I, I need to say this. And the Lord will be like, don't send that text. Why? And you see something and you're ready. I just, I could. And he's like, don't send it. Don't send it. But, Lord, I need to address in, the, in number A and number B and point six. And, and he's like, just don't do it. And when you ignore the Lord, I know y'all have never ignored the Lord, but hypothetically, when you ignore the Lord, how does that work out? How does it work out? There have been times where I've had good counterpoints. I'm like, oh, I need to say it. And the Lord is like, this is, this, don't, don't, don't. I'm like, but Holy Spirit, wait, wait. When you hear this, Lord, it's good. You, you. <laughs> You, you're going to want me to say it. And he's like, don't say it. Don't say it. And there have been times where I've had a good day and a good sensitivity to the Lord, and I've not said it. And the Lord in his faithfulness bring that thing full circle. And he's like, see, I didn't even need your words to work this out. But, oh, there's been so many times where I've said it or I've done it, and I cannot take it back because even apology doesn't undo the pain. He says, look, look, was it worth it? You made your point. But look at the pain. Was it worth it? So here we say the discussion is with the Lord first. What do I say? What do I do? How do I respond? The Lord is for your safety, y'all. He, he is not trying to put you in dangerous, life-threatening situations. Listen, the Lord is trying to show you that his way is better. Give me a chance is what he's saying. Promise-based, product-based commitment demands inspection. Oh, my gosh. And promise-based desires intimacy. Now, here's the deal. Demands inspection versus intimacy. Do you know what it's like to feel like you're under the scrutiny of your spouse? Okay. Did I say it right? Did I do it right? Oh, Lord, I need to ask this question, but if I ask it, I know how she's going to respond. And that's going to lead to a whole thing. Just forget it. Oh, I want to say this to him, but I know it's not going to go well, so just never mind. What happens when you have a product-based commitment is that you're always inspecting the product. Is that how I want, uh, is that how you should have said it? You know how I don't like talking right when I come home from work? You know I don't like talking right before bed? You know I don't like you bringing this stuff up in public? You know I don't like when you do, do that to my mom? 
You know, I don't like when you talk to the kids. Like, it's always you're in this checklist. Did I do it right? Okay, never mind. I'm just going to avoid it altogether. Versus a promise-based commitment that desires intimacy. You know what intimacy means? That means I want to be connected to you. So intimacy, a desire for intimacy, fosters curiosity. Curiosity says, let me not take this at face value. Let me consult the Lord. What in the world? What kind of pain is my wife feeling that would make her respond that way? What, what kind of insecurity is my husband wrestling with that would make him act that way? See, intimacy says, I want closeness with you. And so because of that, I'm going to be curious. Because the Lord has given you access to your spouse's story. See, the Lord has given you the ability to see beyond the behavior. And if you're curious, then you're going to want to know how this person that you love and care for and desire intimacy with could act in that way or say those things or why they're withdrawing. It's not going to be about you. See, we think that our spouses wake up in the morning and they're like, how can I make my spouse's life miserable today? (laughs) What can I do? See, it is a foolish train of thinking that would make me think my husband wakes up in the morning and sets out all his shoes in the kitchen, and in front of the refrigerator, and every place else but the closet, because he is thinking, oh, I'm going to get Jada today. <laughs> Who does that? What he's doing is living his life the way he lives life, because he grew up in a household with an extremely service-oriented mother, two older sisters. He was the youngest boy, and so he didn't have anybody staying on him like that all the time or he wasn't forced to, or he don't really care. A little bit of clutter doesn't bother him the same way. So if I'm not curious and say, you know what? We grew up different. I grew up in a house where both of my parents were very organized. They were, they were neat freaks. I was the oldest, so I did a lot of the cleaning. And so we are different people. Jada, pick the shoes up. It's fine. It doesn't matter if you've been asking him for 18 years to pick up the shoes, because who cares, really? Because if you're not curious, if I, if I want inspection more than intimacy, I'm going to go in on the shoes. How many times have we talked about the shoes? If you love me, you would have picked up the shoes. I don't know how hard it is. What kind of adult person don't know how to pick? Like, it becomes a whole situation. And then you can make yours spiritual. The Lord said we need to have our home in order. You should care about the things. How, look how you're treating the blessings of the Lord. What kind of person can li- That's what happens. Because I want the inspection more than the intimacy. Do I want my husband to feel bad and pick up his shoes? Or do I want him to feel loved and I can get the shoes? Is it that big of a deal? God says, you need to check your heart. Why you can't step over a pair of shoes? Why does that disrupt your day? On the flip side, okay, my husband is a person who likes gratitude and appreciation. I am a horrible encourager. I try. I am not good at it. Again, when you're the oldest child and you do good things, your parents are like, because you're supposed to. Right? You don't get no pats on the back and stuff. It's just like, yeah, whatever. But it's different. We grew up very differently. We're wired differently. So I have to realize that I have to be mindful and conscious of telling him, I appreciate you. Thank you for this. Now, in my mind, sometimes it feels weird to me because I'm not used to that. But, but here's the thing. When you want intimacy, I'm going to say this real quick. When you want intimacy, you, you are so cheering that person on when they're making an effort to love you the way you want to be loved, okay? Not because you're trying to measure if they're going to do a good job, but because you, are, you have a marriage mission mindset that says, I see the effort that you're making. Let me tell you something. If you take it a scale of 1 to 10, when it comes to, to loving uh, gratitude and encouragement, my husband might be at a 9, 8 or 9. He loves it. You, you cannot say thank you enough, and that's not a bad thing. That's how he's wired. I am horrible at it, so I'm probably like a negative 4. I'm a negative four, y'all. Let's just tell the truth. You, listen, you better know what you struggle with. Your spouse knows what you struggle with. Your friends and your family, you need to know it. Don't overestimate yourself. You'll never be able to have a healthy relationship. I know I'm not good at that. So here's what happens. If I work really hard that day and I send all the texts and say, thank you, I appreciate you, you did a good job, I love you so much, and I think I'm killing it, but I missed the two things that were really important to him. What will happen is I I really moved from a negative four to like a two. But he's at a nine, okay? If he wants intimacy, 
He bridges the gap between the nine and the two and says, girl, I see you trying. But when it's about inspection, you say, I'm over here. You still just at a two? You must not love me. You must not have enough. This is what intimacy versus inspection does. Your spouse will always fail the standard that you set for them. You don't measure how close they are to what you want. You measure how far they are from where they started. You say, here is the effort that I see you making. I see you, girl. I saw your thank you. We joke about it. He'd be like, oh, I saw your little thank you text. I'm like, you know, I'm trying. <laughs> you can't tell me nothing. Like, well, I told you thank you today, you know? It is like such a stretch for me. And, and he knows that it probably will never be close to a nine. My, my neat freak is always at a nine on his good day. Listen, when I come home and, and the Reverend Dr. Cohen Edwards has like cleaned the kitchen or something, I'd be like, Ish. <laughs> Listen, it is the Holy Spirit because I know that's not what he's thinking about all day. Throughout my day, I'm thinking about what I'm going to do to the house when I get home. He is living his life working, but I knew he had to pause from his 100 mile an hour life and say, you know what, this would bless my wife. So it don't matter if the pots look the way I would do it or if he did, it doesn't matter. I want the intimacy. And so I celebrate the work that he did from what he's used to, trying to love me the way I want to be loved. When you have a promise-based commitment, it don't matter how many days he doesn't do the kitchen, all it takes is that one. And oh my gosh, look at what we've got. The commitment wasn't gonna change anyway, but now I got this extra because I'm pursuing intimacy, not inspection. That makes sense, y'all? Okay, here's the second page, real quick. Product-based commitment creates relational instability. You're walking on eggshells because you don't know, is this a good day, is this a bad day? Did I say it at the right time? Did I do it the right way? Promise-based provides relational stability. So I always know where I stand. On my worst day, I know where I stand with the Lord. On my worst day. I want to provide that stability for my husband. I want him to know that if we're in an argument, you can still get your favorite dinner. That if we're disagreeing on something, I can still be connected to you. We can still make joint decisions. We can, we can still talk about other things. I don't have to withdraw and shut down my whole excess because you have done something that I don't like. And we know how to be petty with our punishment, right? Your spouse is excited about something and you don't give them any energy back. You're just like, oh, okay. Or, or you know the thing that would bless her or bless him and you don't do it because you're mad about something that happened three days ago y'all didn't talk about. That's relational instability, not knowing where you stand. What is the point of being in a covenant if I'm always questioning the stability of the covenant? You're not questioning your salvation because we should all be in hell. You know on your worst day, God still allows you to come before him. So he says relational stability is what a promise-based commitment produces. Product-based considers what is received, what you're doing for me. Promise is what is given. And then the last one, if you don't change, I withhold my love. We know how to do it. We know how to just be emotionally disconnected. If you're not married, you might do it with your friends. You might do it with your family. We know how to just be like, I'm gonna retreat. I'm gonna make you feel the punishment of not pleasing me. Here's the last one. My love is yours forever. Let's change together. It's a difference, y'all. Let me tell you, you're not going to get it overnight because we, we 22, 23, 23 years in, still don't get it. But I've made some little small millimeter <laughs> steps of growth, but God is gracious. But we have to understand what we're aiming for, okay? So we have these two types of commitment, and then they begin to show us where our heart is, okay? Here is what it means to, to have a healthy, wholehearted marriage Jesus is asking the question, what is the state of your heart? Can I just tell y'all something, how powerful covenant is? In the scripture, if you read the book of Hosea, you will read a story of a man whom God told to marry a prostitute. He said, I want you to go marry her. And she is going to be unfaithful over and over again. And she's going to have children out of her unfaithfulness. And you're going to stay with her, Hosea because I want the nation of Israel to understand how I have stayed with them when they were unfaithful. And I don't know about y'all, but I don't know if my faith is set up like that. I'm coming to the Lord because the shoe's in the floor. And he's like, girl, what, what if I have a greater call for you? How, how are you gonna thrive? Because he's gonna challenge our faith. 
But there's another biblical example. I want you to go read the story of Joshua. In the book of Joshua, Jesus, God tells Joshua, listen, there are some people from these parts of the land that I don't want you to partner with. I don't want you to enter a covenant with these people, Joshua. They're not of me. But you know what happens? A group of people called the Gibeonites. They come together. They make their clothes look like they've been traveling for days. They get old bread because they knew Joshua was trying to see how far they had traveled to know whether or not he could partner with them. They deceived him, y'all. And he entered a covenant with the Gibeonites. You know what the Lord said? Oh, I'll let you go. I understand they tricked you. It's not what he said. I'm going to give you a break. It's not what he said. He said, you have entered a covenant. Even though it was under deception, you must honor it. So he's like, you can miss me, but that's not who I thought it was when I married them. He said, it doesn't matter how you got in the covenant. Once you're in the covenant, you have to honor the covenant because nobody is who you thought they were. We're, we're all changing. But here's what happens. Joshua is now in covenant with the Gibeonites. And lo and behold, the enemies of the Gibeonites show up at the door. Now Joshua is sitting here looking like, I got to fight battles. Because I have enemies of people I shouldn't even be in covenant with. Some of y'all are fighting financial battles and emotional battles and family battles because you're in covenant with people that the Lord didn't approve. But at this point, we're not questioning the covenant. We're asking the direction of the Lord. Because can I tell you what's beautiful about this story? It is when Joshua went to battle with the enemies that were not his because of his covenant with the Gibeonites that we see the scripture, the sun stood still. Do you understand that that is a miracle that Joshua would have missed had he tried to get out of that covenant even though he thought he had reason to? There are miracles that you might miss when you try to get out of the covenant that God has not asked you to get out of. God will do the greater thing when you stay and trust him than when you try to make the early exit. God says, if you understand how serious I am about covenant, I will give you my resources. I will alter nature. I will bring miracles in your life. I will show you the impossible. Things you would have never seen had you tried to do it your way. So now Joshua is bound to someone who deceived him, inherited enemies that were not his, but saw a miracle he never would have seen. That is what God does about covenant. That's what he does. So you have to ask this question, Lord, what is the condition of my heart? Because Jesus told the Pharisees, what? It's because of your hard-heartedness. That's why we're here. So on the front side of your handout, real quick, we're going to go through these three phases of the heart. I want to start with half-hearted. Maybe you're struggling and your marriage is in a half-hearted place. This is Revelation 2, where Jesus is talking to the church at Ephesus. He's like, yeah, I see you doing these things. You're trying to do some work for me and work on false teachers, but you have not, you've lost your love for me. He said, but what about me, right? When you have a half-hearted marriage, here's what happens. You focus on secondary good things. They're good, but they're secondary. So I'm going to do my best at work and career. I'm going to just kill it in my parenting because I don't want to deal with the marriage. It's half-hearted. I I don't want to mess with that. Let me just lean into the areas that I think I do well in. Secondly, you have a teammate mentality. So we get through the logistics of the day. We schedule, we pay our bills together, we live together, but we're not thriving. This happens a lot in Christian marriages, especially if you're scared to death of divorce. Then you just stay in marriages and and it's mediocre. Or maybe you've been married over 30 years. This is what happens if you're not intentional about flourishing. And lastly, love is activity, not intimacy. If I ask you how you love your spouse, you're like, well, because I clean up and I do this and I buy his clothes and I do whatever. Or I work and I do this for her and I do that. If you listen to things you do and not just the promise that you've made, the intimacy then you might be in a half-hearted marriage. And how do we fix that? We fix that by returning to our first love. And it's not your spouse. Your spouse can't be your first love. It's not going to go well. They cannot be your first covenant. You have to already be in covenant with the Lord. That's why this marriage standard is for believers. You have to already be in covenant with Jesus Christ as Savior before you can try to live in the covenant of marriage that he designed. Anybody trying to live a Christ-centered marriage without Christ is setting themselves up for failure. So what do we do when you're hard-hearted? This might be where you are in your marriage today. 
hard-hearted, what Jesus talked about. Then we see Exodus 7. That's the story of Pharaoh. You know what God did to Pharaoh with his, heart, with his hard heart? Locusts, gnats, frogs. Fly. Listen, he might not be bringing it that way in your life, but if you're hard-hearted, you can believe that the Lord is going to set up barriers to block your flourishing until you deal with what's happening in this covenant. You cannot compartmentalize covenant relationships. You can't say, I'm going to leave this over here and just try to live my life. If you're hard-hearted in your marriage, it may look like this, that you're ignoring God's truth, ignoring God's people, and your happiness is your priority. So much so that like the Pharisees, you try to put your happiness in the words of the Lord. Well, Jesus, didn't you say? He said, "Mm mm-mm. Have you not heard from the beginning? So there may be some truth that God is exposing you to and you're not trying to hear it. There's probably some people that are asking you some good questions. And it might be 10 people saying, I agree with you. Do what you want. Do what you feel. And it's going to be that one person, that one person that's like, mm. God is like, listen, that's my voice. My voice won't be the popular voice. It's going to be the exception voice. Yeah. Yeah. And all of us can look back over our decisions and say, you know what? There was somebody that tried to tell me, but I didn't want to hear it. When our hearts are hard, what do we do? How do we fix that? We repent. That is confession. You need to tell the Lord, I have ignored your word. I have chosen my feelings. He's going to give you grace, but you have to be honest with God where you have chosen your feelings over his truth. And then he can restore us. And lastly, the wholehearted marriage is what we all want. Ephesians 5, the scripture that, that we know, wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. That's no small feat, by the way. Because submission, Jesus Christ modeled that. He did it perfectly to the point of obedience on the cross, is what Philippians 2 says. He did it with humility, not trying to have ego or equality. And loving like Christ, listen, Romans 8 says, what shall separate us? That word means divorce. What shall divorce us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, trial, height, death, things past, things present? No. He's saying, husbands, that's how you need to love your wives. So the wholehearted marriage, it means that there is mutual submission. There's sacrificial service. There's unbreakable love. Not perfect, but you're on the path to a wholehearted marriage. If you're here, what do you need to do? You need to repeat the cycle. Who are you mentoring? Who are you coaching? Be honest. Be transparent. Tell everybody you didn't wake up one day and come out of the womb living a wholehearted marriage. Tell them about the times where it almost ended. Tell them about the problems you still haven't resolved. Tell them after 30 years you're still learning about each other. Tell them that there is vulnerability and hard things, but on the other side, you get to see the beauty of God's grace. This is what we want, y'all, a wholehearted marriage. Now, my friend, um, about a month or so ago, got in a car accident, and I was thinking about this. I don't know if this has happened to you, but you get in a car accident, and it's a lot of damage, and insurance is trying to figure out if they're going to total it or repair it. Now, in my younger days, it would have been cool to have uh, a new car. You're like, oh, just total it. Give me the check. But then as you get older, if y'all can just give us a minute, if you, if, as you get older, you start to realize that, do I want a new car note? Let me just see how much it is to repair. And then they say, well, we might not be able to have the parts for a while. And you're like, uh, that's okay. I'll wait. Well, it might not be an exact match to what you were used to. It's fine. I'll wait. I'll wait. Well, it might be a little different. You know, we've got supply chain delays, and you might have to take it here to get it fixed. And it might. It's fine. I'll wait. I'll wait. Because as you get older, and you start to realize that a new car is not as great as you think it is, especially if you gotta buy a new used car, you taking in some other car's history and you gotta start all over again, you start to realize that I need to put my energy in the repair and not the replace. I need to try to fix what I already have committed to instead of trying to replace it and thinking something better is gonna come along because here's what's the same, the driver. You're still the same, whether you repair or replace. And so God is saying, if you would take that same approach to your marriage, take the time to invest in the repairing of your marriage. And yes, some things might be on back order. Your growth might be slow. His growth might be slow. It's okay. It might not come in the way that you thought it was going to come. It's okay because God is in the business of repairing. He wants to show you that what you're ready to discard and get rid of, he can rebuild. Listen, we need to show the world, church, and ourselves how Christian marriages are built. We are not flaky. We don't threaten just because we're afraid. We don't have a spirit of fear. We don't belittle just because we need to feel empowered. The Holy Spirit is our source of power. We don't quit because it looks convenient because we have a covenant keeping God that stays with us. 
We understand that love is not fickle. It doesn't matter the season or the climate or the culture or the circumstance, that a covenant is something that cannot be broken. And that the way God has loved us in our unfaithfulness, we will love our spouses when they fail us. We will want to be loved that way when our spouses fail us. So I just need to know if I have some some people in the room who are ready to be a witness to this world, to help them understand that marriage is not something that you contemplate every year. Am I going to stay or am I going to go? This is what I'm saying. I'm saying yes to the Lord. He saved me. He can save my marriage. He sanctifies me. He can sanctify my marriage. God is in the business of repairing what you're trying to replace. And I just want to pray for us. I know Pastor Matt's probably about to come up. I want to pray for us real quick because I know these messages, they're great if you're in a good place. It's not that great if you're not in a good place. So I just want to pray for us because the enemy would love to get a foothold here. He knows what healthy marriage can do to a society, to a city, to a nation, to the world. Father, we thank you so much for your perfect example, your unbreakable love, for a covenant that we will never fully understand. And Lord, we just confess where we have made decisions that go against what you require of us. We confess where we've chosen our feelings over your truth. And I pray right now, God, just for a fresh outpouring of your grace. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for second chances and fifth chances and 96 chances. Lord, I pray that you would give us a desire to want to realign with your mission for marriage. And for those in the room that might feel hopeless, like this is too late, God, would you show them that you are the God of the impossible? Would you begin to stir hope in our hearts? Get rid of the shame and the guilt and remind us that you are a merciful God. And if you are for us, who can be against us? In Jesus' name we pray, amen.